Hi, it's Dr. Cassoni. Today we're going to talk about the six stages of gut disease. Over the last 20 plus years as a holistic primary care provider, I've treated many thousands of patients with severe GI tract pathologies. GI tract means gastrointestinal tract, which refers to the gut and the stomach and the entire digestive system. I myself have had very serious GI tract complications when I was younger, which led me to be hospitalized and even seek treatments outside of the country. And at that time, I couldn't get the help I needed in the US. The GI tract doctors, unfortunately, are one of the specialties that are not very good in this country. They are good for advanced diagnostics and ruling out something more serious, but they tend to wait until there's something obvious before looking at the function or even diet. They're quick to jump to antacids, steroids, antibiotics, and then start cutting sections of the GI tract before they're looking at the basics. And there seems to be no focus on causative factors and no focus, even though they're the specialty, in improving the function of the system itself. We're gonna start off with the first stage, which is loss of function. Loss of function refers to some part of the system that's not working the way it should. You can think that as long as the body is functioning the way it's designed, you really don't have any problems, you don't have any symptoms. So this first stage is going to reflect both the external irritants, which might be something in the diet that is too hard to break down or digest, and also the internal function, external irritants plus internal function. If the internal function is amazing and very powerful, then the person can eat just about anything. There is a decline in function, which could be from deficiencies, could be from stress, could just be the body needs a little bit of help. That's part of holistic care, has supporting the body where it needs it and when it needs it. If some part of the body is not working the way it should within the gut system, then on top of that, the person's eating foods that are harder to digest, which is very hard to avoid nowadays as our modern day food supply, especially in the United States, is terrible. Well, when that starts to happen, now we're gonna to start to get symptoms. This first stage is loss of function. And it does include identifying foods that may be the irritant. Hopefully, we're not just doing that alone. A lot of people are doing specialized diets or carnivore diets or these extreme dietary strategies. And I understand it's great when they're getting success, but they're missing the rest of the picture. We want to improve the function. That way, the dietary restrictions may not have to be long-term. Keep in mind, we're also in a time period where the food supply isn't great. We have so many patients who have severe gut issues and diabetes and autoimmune issues, and they go outside of this country and they can eat bagels all day and they lose weight and they're fine. Everything kind of turns around. So there's a lot to that. We are having to work harder than we should. When we're dealing with loss of function in the upper GI tract, that's where we're gonna start our journey. It really is all about digestion. The upper GI tract has the stomach, the pancreas, and the gallbladder primarily, right? The stomach is really the big player here. And when you eat food, it floods with stomach acid, hydrochloric acid. And that is gonna do two things, right? That's going to break down the food, which is digestion. It's gonna break down the food and liquefy it into something called chyme, right? So it's like a hot liquid magma. It takes your food and turns it into chyme. It's also going to disinfect your food. So breaking it down and neutralizing any pathogenic agents like bacteria, virus, fungus, mold, parasite, etc. You can think of a dog, for example, they produce more acid than humans and they're able to eat raw chicken. And it is because their stomach acid is antimicrobial. It's getting rid of anything harmful and they're able to eat it. And they don't even chew. They just kind of pinch and swallow their food because their stomach acid is so strong. It's an interesting point to recognize that antacids are typically 
overprescribed. Somebody has poor digestion, right? They have indigestion, which can have bloat and it can have acid reflux or heartburn as symptoms, but those are symptoms of poor digestion. It's not that their digestion is so amazing that their food is sitting and bloating and irritating and then it's refluxing up into the esophagus. That, that doesn't come from great digestion. That comes from under-functioning, poor digestion plus some food that's hard to digest. So a doctor that prescribes an antacid, which can be the proton pump inhibitor or H2 blocker or combo or Tums, any of those things are really going to be working against digestion. They're taking somebody who has a loss of function, stage one, and they're actually making it worse. And the reason they do that is because they're trying to manage the liability of progression of irritation on the lower esophageal area because that can become inflamed and irritated and over time turn into a precancerous condition called Barrett's esophagitis. Better would be to improve the digestion so that there's no irritation. I've had many severe Barrett's esophagitis patients and once we improve the digestion, which may even include adding acid short term, a pill that has some acid plus enzymes to help the food fully break down, takes all the pressure off of that lower esophageal area and everything starts to work normal. Remember, we're studying the body and the normal physiology with the philosophy, the basic underlying philosophy that the body was designed miraculously. So when in doubt, study its design, don't shut it down. I would be very careful when we're doing treatments that are going against normal physiology, at least long term. And these drugs typically have warning labels that tell patients not to take them for more than 14 days, although they're prescribed for years, just stay on them, right? We have a 30-year-old male patient who's been on those medications for years and has osteoporosis. That's unheard of, but that's because the medication as has shut down this person's ability to fully digest and then that compromises absorption. So now they're deficient in some very critical ways. So when we look at this first stage of loss of function, it could be anywhere in this system. Could be loss of motility, which would compromise some of the lower GI tract and bowel functions, but we don't want to miss the upper GI tract, right? So Oftentimes treatment is going to be identifying hard to digest foods and restricting those at least short term while possibly adding something like the acid plus enzyme combination. That's going to help somebody fully break down their food. Once we leave the stomach, the stomach is mainly producing acid and at least one enzyme for digesting protein because it's harder to digest. After you leave the stomach, after the food leaves the stomach, that's where the pancreas adds the enzymes. That's after the stomach, not in the stomach. And the gallbladder adds the bile. So if somebody is having a hard time with that bile, they're gonna have the symptoms of constipation. They're going to have a hard time digesting greasy or fatty foods. That kind of food will sit very heavy for them. And they might even see floating stool or light colored stool and this is a gallbladder issue. They might even feel a little pinching or pain sometimes in their upper right rib area, which is where the liver gallbladder is. When treating patients for their upper GI tract function, we consider products like what we carry, the digest that we have is what we carry for the enzyme and acid. We also have something for the gallbladder. We have a number of ways to uh, move the biliary ducts, get them moving so that they're not congested. The primary would be beet concentrates. So the products that have beet concentrates do really well for the gallbladder. Keep in mind that if your biliary ducts or gallbladder ducts are congested, that means the liver is getting congested and there's going to be some liver symptoms. The liver's a huge filter and we're gonna have allergic reactions, inflammation, possibly waking up at two, three in the morning, difficulty handling blood sugars. So many things are related to that liver. Just understand that we're looking at the stomach function, the gallbladder function, 
And for the pancreas, it's getting stressed out if the first two aren't working very well. If your stomach acid is underproducing, which is called hypochlorhydria, then the pancreas is gonna have to work harder making enzymes to compensate. And the pancreas also produces hormones that balance blood sugar. So, so often we're seeing patients who have blood sugar issues like a diabetic or pre-diabetic or somebody who hasn't seen any of those numbers on their labs yet, but they're having weight gain and cravings and fluctuating energy levels but it could be that their pancreas is in trouble. They're heading down the road to that diabetic pattern. They're just not there yet, so the doctor doesn't say anything, but they're at the same time having some digestive issues, bloat, stool pattern change, etc. Just think that pancreas is in trouble. When the pancreas is in trouble, treatment requires a little bit more of an individualized intake and a bit more investigation into diet, and also the treatment strategy has to be a little bit more careful because it may involve custom herbal formulas. Uh, consider, for example, something that's going to help the liver, make sure that the liver part of the blood sugar handling equation is decongested. So we're looking at liver function with pancreatic function. Our, our product Digest does have some pancreas extracts, some bovine extracts that are for that purpose of repairing the pancreas if there's no other complications. So people taking the digest, they're getting the benefit of improved digestion, pancreatic support, which also can help the blood sugars and digestion. The next stage, if we progress, right, you still have loss of function. What happens over time is the stage called irritation. Irritation happens over time. A little bit of irritation is not really gonna cause a lot of pain or disruption, but if it continues, if it continues for a month, or for six months or a year or a few years, well, now we have a problem. So irritation in this stage, there may be some increased bloat sensation. Their abdominal distension is the same thing as bloated. It's as if you ate a sandwich, but it feels like you ate two sandwiches, right? Sometimes people call that the food baby. As this stage worsens, there will be some stool pattern change, maybe fluctuating between formed and loose and if it's bad enough there might be a sense of urgency stool keep in mind that if that first stage if the stomach wasn't disinfecting the food by stage number two there could be an accumulation of transient flora most people have heard of the microbiome which is a part of our digestive system that's loaded with healthy bacteria it's throughout the system, but primarily in the lower GI tract. Think of it like a healthy garden. And this healthy garden of bacteria has some functions. It protects us. It breaks down foods in the lower GI tract that weren't fully broken down in the upper GI tract. And it is also an important part of our immune system. If our upper GI tract, though, is not disinfecting the food properly, we're going to get a slow accumulation of bad flora or transient flora versus the healthy flora, which we call the resident flora. When that happens, think of it like you're getting some weeds in the garden. And that can also start irritating the system and exacerbating the bloated feeling. The food is now going in and interacting with that flora, causing some extra gas and bloat. And that flora now has to be removed. You'll especially notice that there's transient flora when there is foul gas versus just gas. Gases in digestion, right? Not enough acid, for example. And then foul gas would be that there's some of the infection in there, right? The transient flora. If we have foul stool, like it's like, don't go in there after you're done that's gonna be another sign that's gonna correlate, right? So foul gas, foul stool, and then stickier stool, like the person has to wipe more. This would all be signs that are gonna correlate with some transient flora. If it's bad enough, then it's going to start to show up on the tongue. There's gonna to be a thicker tongue coating. And just think that tongue is the front of the GI tract. That's why it's so important to look at so that we can see how the health of the gut is because you're gonna see that coating on the tongue. And if it's getting very thick, 
that means that the infection's coming all the way up onto the tongue. The person could try to brush it off, that's not gonna do it. It's really coming from the entire system. And once that is happening, now if there's a little bit of leaky gut, a little bit of a failure of the intestines to keep that out, that infection can start to go into the bloodstream and cause systemic inflammatory responses. That's why so many clinicians connect leaky gut concepts to other diseases like autoimmune diseases. Not all autoimmune disease cases have gut issues, but for the people who have gut issues and autoimmune diseases, they need to address the gut issue for sure. In stage two, irritation, if there was an endoscopic examination, that's the camera scope, or a colonoscopy, which is another camera scope, so one's coming from on top and one's from below, they would not see anything. Because remember, the camera scope is only looking for something visual. It can't see function. And in the irritation stage, there really isn't inflammation yet, so the report of findings would be unremarkable. And I've had patients who are having 20 episodes of diarrhea a day, they can't leave their house, it's waking them up at night. They go to the GI tract specialist, they do a colonoscopy and tell the patient nothing's wrong with them. No treatment offered, even though the person's miserable. So that's just silly. It's a functional problem at that point. I'm glad that the specialist is looking for something more serious. That is what I would want. We refer out to have those advanced diagnostics performed, but we gotta return to function, and when somebody is clear of anything more serious, the entire treatment has gotta be a functional one. We've gotta understand the physiology with the goal of being returning to normal functioning system. During irritation, if there is gas, the person will feel a sense of fullness, and that could be relieved by passing the gas, but there won't be pain. The next stage is inflammation. During this stage, the irritation has, been, has gone on long enough from the loss of function that parts of the system are inflamed, and it could be more than one area. In this stage, if there was a camera scope like we discussed, there would be inflammation written on the report of findings. It might show pictures of red sections so the inflammation is gonna be charted, but we know that that's going on if there's pain. If there is pain, then there's inflammation. And in this stage, the pain is typically migrating, achy, comes and goes, diffuse. That's how you know it's inflamed. If the person gets gas, the gas will push up against the inflamed section, causing pain, and then it's relieved when they pass the gas. But the inflammation was still there. They're just not feeling it until something's bothering it. If they get a cramp, like in an irritated bowel situation, where their body's gonna cramp, and then they have a sense of urgency bowel movement, in this stage, the cramp hurts because the cramp is cramping the intestinal tubing, right? The lumen is wrapped with muscle, of the intestines and it's cramping on an inflamed section, so that hurts. Whereas in stage two, it just feel like a cramp with no pain. During stage two and stage three, we're still going back to the basics. We're treating any infection using antimicrobial herbs if there's a transient flora infection, removing foods that are irritating, helping improve the upper GI tract function with the digest or the liver gallbladder treatment or herbs if needed for that part of it. And then if we end up in stage four, which is ulceration, it means that the damage has gone to the point of damaging the tissue. The entire GI tract is lined with a protective lining called the mucosal lining. It is now at this point damaged to the point where the soft tissue underneath is wounded. The symptoms change from pain that is migrating, achy, diffuse. Instead now, just by talking to the patient, the pain is going to be localized, sharp, and stabbing. It's gonna hurt in one area, it's gonna linger. It may come and go. If it's bad enough, it'll be more consistent, but it is a wound in a single area. Depending on the nature of the pain and the specific location, it might be a referral out just for that reason that we need to know what's going on. We have a big, beautiful office and we see a lot of patients. We have a high volume practice, but we don't have advanced diagnostics. The other option would be to treat it immediately and if it does not improve within a reasonable window, 
then it's a referral out because we need to know what exactly is going on. Most of the time we can figure out what's going on by a good history and by talking to the patient, getting the onset and a description of everything that's happened. With the females, we're differentiating from below the navel. Any kind of pain could be uterine, bladder, ovaries. There could be some other complications. But really, we're looking at pain that is worsening or improving based on either eating or defecating. The ulceration stage includes any damage, right? So this could include a diverticula in the colon, a polyp. Uh, depending on where the damage is, it's labeled differently in conventional care, but to most holistic practitioners, it's just a level of damage. So whether it's gastroenteritis or ga called gastritis or ulcers, it really is still, we have got to protect the mucosal lining at this stage. So the strategies, we have a product called Repair, and we commonly use our functional formula called S71. If you're learning formulas with us, you'll learn about these formulas. S71 is soothing to GI tract function and helps to heal the mucosal lining. And then Repair also has glutamine and okra, aloe. It has ingredients in it that just heal up that mucosal lining because we are trying to do damage control by healing up the wound. That becomes the first priority with a case like that, when it's sharp stabbing localized pain. We've got to get that under control so that they don't worsen and end up in the hospital. Using that protocol where we're trying to heal up the mucosal lining doesn't really take care of the cause of the damaged mucosal lining and the wound. The cause is going to be going back to the first areas that we talked about with loss of function. That's what caused it all. But when somebody comes in with those symptoms that are more severe, then the focus has to be to get the pain to go away by protecting the mucosal lining, healing up the wound. And maybe if there's a concurrent infection, getting rid of the infection while healing up the wound. That's where we might combine the S71 with our D3 functional formula, which is a strong antimicrobial or we also have in tablet form, the Resolve. Now these products we use with treatment that is based on a functional diagnosis with patients under our care, but they're still worth educating you about. Stage five is scarring. Now this is where it gets a little bit more serious. It's not that it wasn't serious in stage four, but the body does turn around and heal when you give it the chance. But in stage five, some of those sections that were damaged start to scar. And wherever you have scarring within the lumen of the GI tract, the lumen is the tube, wherever you have scarring, the problem is, is that it's a section that's non-functional. It's non-elastic, it's not contributing to motility or assimilation, it's not producing protective qualities like the mucosal lining, it's a sitting duck. And the problem with that, it's also going to risk some of the tissue sloughing off like a necrotic dead tissue, almost like if you had a really dry skin on your legs and you had some flaky skin, well, that is going on in the lumen. And if your body is, if the person's body is healthy enough, it's going to distinguish those necrotic pieces and it will know how to get rid of it. If that person's body is more hyperactive though, or already inflamed, then there could be an abnormal reaction to that necrotic debris, and that might trigger an autoimmune reaction. So stage five includes Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. These are under a subcategory called inflammatory bowel disease. These are autoimmune conditions, and they're described based on where they're located and if there's spacing in the lesions, but generally to the holistic minded practitioner, we're looking at the function, we're looking at the diet, we're looking at repairing the mucosal lining. More important is the response to the patient and that we're calming down the entire cascade of irritation. We have amazing outcomes when working on this holistically, but at this point, conventional care may choose to resection those areas or remove them surgically. 
if they don't respond to steroids or immune suppressants like methotrexate or Humira. These drugs are potent. They're really not safe for long-term use. If you're prescribed them, you really need to talk to the prescribing doctor about whether or not they're going to be a good fit for you long-term. But are they doing anything to increase your digestion? Are they doing anything to treat the cause of this whole cascade of irritation and inflammation and ulceration? And the chances are they're not. If they're a GI tract specialist, they just don't look at it. They just put you on the drugs right away. I'm not saying those drugs are never useful. It's just that we don't want to rely on them. Best case scenario, our severe autoimmune Crohn's and colitis patients might use something like a steroid if they have to for a flare-up to calm, calm down the inflammation, but they're managing the case with us holistically so that they don't get the flare-ups and they have as improved function of the GI tract as possible. That's ideal. IBS is different terminology than IBD. IBD is the autoimmune we just discussed. IBS is irritable bowel syndrome. So just think whenever there's a syndrome, it just means unknown cause. It's, a, it's really a non-diagnosis. So at that point, it's a description of symptoms. So IBS would be a description of symptoms that can include constipation or diarrhea or a mix of the two, sense of urgency stool. This is all under the umbrella of IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. So that includes much of what we described in the first few stages. Keep in mind that if there was a diagnostic reason for that pattern, for example, there was a parasite infection causing the stool pattern change, then the diagnosis is parasite infection. IBS is really a non-diagnostic terminology describing symptoms. Stage six is abnormal cell growth patterns. This is your cancers. Unfortunately, colorectal cancer is increased, especially in the United States. And once again, could go back to our food supply and some of our lifestyle habits. Cancer is complicated and it can involve genetics and a lot of different things, but it's at least an underreaction. It's a failure of the body to catch a mutation in the system when it's happening. If it was caught by the body, early on, then the body would get rid of it probably very easily. So when there is a mutated cell and it hijacks a blood supply and it starts to grow and spread, this is because the body was too overwhelmed and confused. It was too inflamed. It started to have hyper reactions and then it started to have hypo reactions, right? The under reactions are like in the body if you get a cut and it doesn't heal. So same thing here. It's not catching mutations, and then things that aren't us start to develop and grow, and that, of course, can be quite risky. As far as the GI tract specialist, I love it when they go in there for their colonoscopy, and they find something that's cancerous and remove it, and the person's instantly cancer-free. That is valid, and I've seen that so many times where somebody went in for a routine colonoscopy, and they found something and it's removed. They may not handle prevention of reoccurrence very well, but that's what we do in the Herb Academy is talk about how to treat the body, how to improve its function, and that's going to tremendously reduce reoccurrence. It is something special to have something immediately surgically removed and you're at no risk anymore at that point, at that point. Other cancer treatments can be super invasive and sometimes it's not clear whether or not the chemo, the radiation is more harmful than beneficial. I think it's a mix sometimes. I don't think it's always bad. Certainly there are patients who are over medicated and the treatment itself becomes worse than the cancer. Unfortunately, because it's a high liability disease category, the oncologists are really stuck with doing one size fits all treatments and there's really not much patient centered individualization when it comes to cancer care. For us, we're always gonna be going back to improving gut health. That concludes our talk about the six stages of gut diseases. Join us in the Herb Academy if you're interested for more information and how to use herbs. The way that we teach herbs is you gotta know the physiology. You can't just take the natural herb for the symptom. You have to look at what the cause of the symptom is and now the herbs are designed at treating the physiology, the underlying root cause. See you next time.